Hello revolution students and welcome back to another video on the Chinese revolution. Uh, China, a area of study one, 1912 up to 1949. In this video, we are going to look at the Jiangxi Soviet. So the Jiangxi Soviet was that Soviet set up by the CCP and in particular Mao Zedong and Zhu De after they'd fled from Jingjiangshan. Um, and it was uh, set up on the 10th of February 1929 and went through until the 16th of October 1934 when uh, the CCP were forced to flee from Jiangxi Soviet and go on the long march all the way up to Yunnan. Uh, that uh, very significant event which uh, contributed to Mao becoming the eventual the leader of the CCP. The Jiangxi Soviet itself was uh, uh, situated in Jiangxi province to the east of Hunan province, Mao's, uh, where Mao grew up, and to the southwest of Shanghai. So this Soviet, very, very significant event in the history of the CCP and in, uh, in also in Mao's, uh, Mao's eventual rise to power. So let's have a look at some of the key points now. Let's get into it. So the first point here, as I was just alluding to, so Mao's uh, authority increased. So when he became, when he set up the Jiangxi Soviet, he was eventually appointed by the CCP as the chairman of the executive committee of the Jiangxi Soviet on the 7th of November 1931. And this um, authority reduced though when uh, the Politburo moved to Rujin from Shanghai in January 1933. So the CCP leadership, the 28 Bolsheviks and so forth, they had been still located in Shanghai. But uh, Mao Zedong uh, had been uh, living in Rujin. Rujin was the uh, capital of the Jiangxi Soviet in Jiangxi province. Uh, and when the CCP leadership were forced to flee from Shanghai, they actually came to the Jiangxi Soviet and they um, pushed Mao Zedong aside pretty much. And then they started controlling the Soviet. <laughs> Um, one of the key one of the key actions of the Jiangxi Soviet under Mao Zedong's leadership was that they uh, declared war on Japan on the 18th of April 1932, and this was a, a key act on the CCP's part because it increased uh, CCP popular support within the Jiangxi Soviet. And we're going to have a look at uh, some figures soon about how big this uh, Soviet grew and how many people the CCP and Mao Zedong governed in the Soviet. Yeah, um, very big population. So this declaration of war on Japan, very important because it showed that the CCP were patriotic, um, uh, very patriotic in trying to defend uh, China, even though, even though the Jiangxi Soviet was way down south um, in China and the, J the Japanese had not invaded Jiangxi Soviet, they had uh, occupied Manchuria. But still, it was you know even uh, it was a um, you know it was a significant act nonetheless for increasing their popular support and showing that they were doing what a government should do, I suppose, in China compared to what if we contrast that with what uh, Jiang Jishu and the Kuomintang did when uh, Japan occupied Manchuria. Jiang uh, Jishu did very little other than moving some troops up to the border. Um, the Manchurian border. But other than that, uh, Zhang Yuxiu did not declare war on Japan. Instead, he declared, um, he, he just let them pretty much have Manchuria. Uh, and there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, for Zhang Yuxiu, he, he felt that uh, the Japanese were less of a threat to, uh, to his authority than the CCP. And we're going to have a look at how we tried to destroy the CCP in a minute in Jiangxi Soviet. But he um, he saw uh, the CCP as more of a threat, and he saw them as more of a threat to his authority because he was a good student of history, as many of these leaders were. And throughout Chinese history, it was often uh, internal enemies, internal threats, peasant revolts. Um, you know, alternative alternative leaders rising up, rebellions rising up within China, which had overthrown uh, the dynasties, the dynasties in China, rather than external invasion. I mean, there were a couple of examples. You have obviously the Manchu who invaded China in 1644, um, who overthrew the Ming. And then prior to that, you had the Mongol invasions. Yes, but um, apart from those 
those couple of invasions, most of the, uh, throughout China's long history, dynastic history, most of the dynasties had collapsed or been overthrown by um, internal opposition within China. And Zhang Jishe, being a good historian, understanding Chinese history, um, saw the CCP as a greater threat to his authority and um, saw quite clearly they were the ones who were going to be able to overthrow him eventually. He felt that the Japanese, um, China was just too big for the Japanese uh, to take over all of it. And also he was uh, banking on the fact that the US would probably come to China's aid against uh, the Japanese invasion, which eventually they did. Um, and then that all links into that very famous quote of Zhang Jishu that he saw the Japanese as a disease of the skin, whereas the CCP were a disease of the heart, a more fatal disease. You can cure diseases of the skin, but if you've got a disease of the heart right here, you've got more problems. Okay, let's keep going on. The next key point. So in relation to that, um, Zhang Jishu, he launched, and we can see here, four failed encirclement campaigns between December 1930 and October 1933. These encirclement campaigns were encirclements around the Jiangxi Soviet. He tried to encircle it and then destroy the CCP within. Each time, though, um, at least the first three anyway, uh, Mao Zedong and Zhu De successfully lured uh, the um, Zhang Jishu and his troops, or more, more not him, but the GMD troops, deep within uh, the Jiangxi Soviet, within the mountains and so forth, and then when they got them exhausted or extended their lines of supply, they attacked them and they destroyed and destroyed them. So the first four encirclement campaigns were failures for the GMD. The fifth one was a success and what they did was they actually brought in, Zhang Jishu decided to get some external advice and he brought in um, a general a general from the Weimar from Nazi Germany to come and support him and that general uh, advised uh, Zhang Jishu to build blockhouses all around uh, the Soviet and then slowly tighten the noose and build more and more blockhouses until uh, these concrete blockhouses, concrete towers, which the CCP couldn't destroy and until the CCP was starved and, you know, crushed. And that's when the CCP realised they had to escape from Jiangxi Soviet and go on their long march, which was eventually successful, but not after many, many deaths of CCP members. The next key point. So, um, Within the Jiangxi Soviet, it gave an opportunity for Mao to further develop his uh, guerrilla warfare tactics alongside Zhu De, who was a brilliant tactician and strategist. And uh, so what he did was he had, uh, they had their general strategy, and we're going to have a look at in a sec, just some one of their sort of like four key points. Um, I'll show that up down here in a sec. But the other thing that he managed to do was he actually inspired his troops and he, and he set down some really good um, rules on discipline and the eight points for attention. And most of these, the three main rules of discipline and the eight points for attention, their main aim was to make sure that soldiers within the Jiangxi Soviet uh, treated the peasant population well, treated and respected the peasant population because Mao Zedong realized without the support of the peasant population within the Jiangxi Soviet, the CCP would not survive. It was a key, a key understanding of Mao Zedong. And through these three main rules of discipline and the eight points for attention, um, uh, the, cease, the Red Army got the support of the peasants and their, their army grew and they got more and more followers and recruits. The other key uh, point or the key act that Mao implemented within the Jiangxi Soviet to uh, improve uh, support for the CCP was uh, he implemented, and you can see there, a moderate land reform policy so he land was taken only from brutal landlords and redistributed to all peasants, even rich peasants. So he realized through his experience in the Jiangxi Soviet and, and other places prior to this, he realized that um, earlier on he'd, he'd been an advocate of taking um, land from all landlords, even rich peasants 
who may have owned some land but also worked the land themselves. He believed all that land should be redistributed to poorer peasants. But in practice, he realized that the rich peasants were often the ones who were more efficient farmers and produced more grain. So he didn't want to put those farmers offside. So what he did with his moderate land reform policy in the Jiangxi Soviet was he tended to take our land just from absentee landlords okay and uh, enable the rich peasants to keep their land in order to uh, keep up grain production and so forth and make sure that the uh, first of the population didn't starve but also the red army and the ccp didn't starve next key point um uh, at the Jiangxi Soviet, the ccp also um, implemented a number of social reforms and you can see those there so it included included reading classes for soldiers and peasants and campaigns to stop foot binding forced marriages and child slavery, all those patriarchal uh, oppressive policies or um, uh, things that occurred in China for centuries. A big thing for the communists uh, was to empower, we know this, to empower the people and one of the uh, key ways to empower people is to educate them. So uh, lots of, a um, lot of reading classes you can see and literacy, literacy levels within the Jiangxi Soviet rose as a consequence. And then finally, the final key point here is that Mao Zedong and other CCP leaders gained experience in governing a large population. And here's that stat there that I was talking about. So the, the Jiangxi Soviet contained 3 million people. So a very big population, very big population. And this, this experience in governing a population like that, a huge population, bigger than Tasmania and so forth, um, uh, contributed to the, the eventual success when, when, of the CCP because when they started, when they had to leave the Jiangxi Soviet, they went on their long march up to Yunnan and then um, uh, they started expanding in Yunnan, gaining control over more population up there, and then the eventual war with Japan, full-blown war, then occurred from 37 onwards. Um, and the CCP were fighting the Japanese and also trying to defend themselves against the Kuomintang. Um, this this experience in governing a population meant that they uh, they understood how to retain the support of the population. Okay, and I'm just going to uh, so they're the key points. For the Jiangxi Soviet. And now we'll just have a look at a um, just some a strategy, part of uh, Mao Zedong and Zhu De's guerrilla strategy. And it's just this quote here. So, and here we are, Zhu and Mao's uh, general strategy on guerrilla warfare. So the en enemy advances, we retreat. The enemy camps, we harass. The enemy ties, we attack. And the enemy retreats, we pursue. So it's always I suppose the main aim of Mao Zedong was always to try to um, hit the enemy at their weakest points when they were least prepared and when uh, he and his forces were at their strongest. Okay, now that we've had a look at the Jiangxi Soviet, let's have a look at a couple of uh, historical interpretations. And with the historical interpretations for the Jiangxi Soviet, it's quite interesting. Um, some historians argue that the Jiangxi Soviet was... Um, was a positive thing for much of the population, the people who lived within it, particularly the poor peasants and so forth. Other historians disagree and uh, point out um, the number of deaths that occurred in the Jiangxi Soviet during CCP rule. So let's get into that now. Okay, so our first historical interpretation of the Jiangxi Soviet is from Morris Meisner. And he writes, once established on the populous southern Jiangxi plains, the Red Army grew rapidly, attracting peasant recruits and deserters from warlord and local military forces. By 1930, Mao was sufficiently confident to proclaim a provisional Soviet government, consolidating a dozen smaller communist-controlled areas with his own base area. So, uh, so Morris Meisner is highlighting the fact that there was a rapid growth in the Jiangxi Soviet um, during this period, and it, you know, you would have to that have to be a consequence of um, the social reforms that the CCP put in place, uh, such as the reading classes, the um, banning of foot binding, um, you know, enforced marriages, these age old patriarchal uh, practices that occurred in China. 
Uh, the other key policy, the redistribution of land, which gave land to peasants for the first, poor peasants for the first time. For the first time, many of these poor peasants had enough land to actually grow the amount of food they needed to feed their families. So all, um, all positive outcomes for the population within the Jiangxi Soviet and as a consequence, the reason why the CCP attracted so many new recruits and grew so rapidly within the area. Um, in contrast to this, Chang and Halliday write, the Rujen base that seated the first red state consisted of large parts of the provinces of Jiangxi and Fujian. These two provinces suffered the greatest population decrease in the whole of China from the year when the communist state was founded, 1931, to the, reds, to the year the Reds left, 1935, or late 1934. Given that escapes were few, this means that altogether some 700,000 people died in the Rujin base. A large part of these were murdered as class enemies, or were worked to death, or committed suicide, or died other premature deaths attributable to the regime. So what Chang and Halliday um, are arguing there is that they are saying that the CCP pretty much murdered um, three, uh, you know, 700 million people while they ruled that area. So they are saying that their policy, so the CCP was not a benevolent, the Soviet was not a benevolent um, uh, um, rule while they were in power there. The CCP were actually very, very oppressive and they killed many, many people. I think one thing that uh, Chang and Halliday don't, um, don't take into account is the number of deaths that occurred as a consequence of the, uh, the GMD uh, encirclement campaigns. They were pretty, you know, that's pretty much each of those encirclement campaigns was a war. So five wars to try to destroy the CCP and the Jiangxi Soviet. Anyway, so there are our uh, two contrasting historical interpretations. I hope you have found this video on the Jiangxi Soviet useful for your study of the Chinese Revolution, and I will see you next time. Goodbye.